sometimes it's not so simple. Cursed are they who trust in mere mortals. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. This little section in Jeremiah reminds us of the wisdom tradition of the Old Testament, reflected as well in the very first psalm in the Psalter. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. Both of these texts are wonderful examples of binary thinking. People are either holy or unholy, blessed or cursed. It makes for dramatic rhetoric, but it's not descriptive, I think, of many of us. Me, I'm a mixed bag. <laughs> that is one of my most profound theological insights. <laughs> I am a mixed bag of God's good creation, of God's grace, and of my sinfulness involving both commission and omission, all mixed up sometimes one portion of the bag being more prominent than the other portions. That's true of our country as well. Founded by white people who sought a better, freer life, the cost to Native Americans and enslaved African persons was incalculable. Our founding was a mixed bag of God's good creation, of deep human white aspirations for what is noble and good, and willful destruction of human life to either clear space for those white aspirations or to force women, men, and children to serve slavishly those aspirations. Which America do our fellow citizens have in mind when they campaign to make America great again? And our church, our church. We call our church one holy Catholic and apostolic. It is all of those realities insofar as it is rooted in the Holy Spirit and acting under the gentle and powerful influence of that spirit. The church is God's good creation and is the sinful church, the church of sinners, to the degree that its members live in contradiction to that unity and holiness and Catholicity and fidelity to its best past. From the time of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, our history has been a mixed bag of God's good creation, God's offered presence and companionship, and betrayal of the goodness of the covenant relationship with God, and betrayal of the goodness of our fellow men and women and of our own God-given goodness. What most impresses me about all of this is the astonishing and consoling fact that God seems to hang in there with all of it, with all of the mix, and does so for the long haul. God might even agree with Jacques Maritain, the French Catholic philosopher who spent so much time in the United States, who put it this way, very simply, but very powerfully, human history continues to become better and worse. The Lucan Beatitudes and woes seem to offer us another example of binary thinking rooted in the wisdom tradition, but on closer look, they are not binary at all. I'd like to just dwell with the first Beatitude, otherwise we'll be here for the whole morning. But, uh, <laughs> then Jesus looked up at his disciples, of which there were many present, we were told, and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The Greek word for poor here is tokos, which can also mean destitute. It is related to the verb to cower. What is Jesus saying here? First, what he's not saying. Blessed are you disciples of mine who are very poor, because your poverty, your deep need, turns you to God who alone can help you. This very popular spiritualizing interpretation suggests that being materially impoverished invariably leads people to being more spiritually available to God. 
Of course, this is not true. Some people who are very, very poor are very hospitable when visitors come to their home. Many, many Americans have found that uh, in the developing countries over the years. But destitution can degrade a person's dignity or make someone deeply self-centered or enraged or even violent. A second possible reading. Blessed are you who are my disciples and are spiritually poor because you are not possessed by your possessions even though you possess a lot in comparison with most people. This very popular spiritualizing interpretation lets many of us off the hook. It's, it's like saying that as long as my inner dispositions are in good shape, the existence of destitution in our world need not concern me because the kingdom of God has nothing to do with that situation. So what is Jesus saying in this first beatitude? The context is all important. Jesus looks at his disciples while he announces the beatitudes and woes. We don't know who these disciples were. We're just told there was a large number of them. Surely at least some of them are those he personally called to leave family and home and possessions and to follow him on mission, not knowing where their next meal would come from. They would be praying every day that verse from the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread from wherever it will come. These folks would be poor by choice. Perhaps there are others who were not personally called by Jesus, but who attached themselves to him because of an inner urging to which they responded, or because they found him compellingly attractive. Some of these people might have been very poor, not by choice, but because of the social conditions in Palestine at the time. For, the, for me, the key is that they are all connected to Jesus by choice, and thus connected to God's reign, which is breaking in into the world through his words and actions. So their being blessed has everything to do with their relationship with Jesus and the reign of God. Their material poverty as such is not the reason for their blessedness. But there's more. If I stop there, I too am in danger of spiritualizing the verse. In Luke's gospel, imposed material poverty or destitution is evil. Jesus roundly castigates those human beings in Luke's gospel whose way of life causes or maintains that poverty or destitution. Jesus is unambiguous about that. Jesus might not have known systems theory or sociology or macroeconomics, but he did seem to know that serious economic inequality was rooted in human choices, not God's will or fate's whim. Imposed poverty stood in contradiction to the reign of God. In other words, it stood in contradiction to this world as God wishes it to be, which is what the reign of God is, where all are equally children of God and all share equitably in the goods of the earth. To sum up, these men and women are blessed who, if poor, are deeply bonded to Jesus and his mission and to the values of God's reign, and who therefore are committed to participating with all their energies in God's project in the world, which is Jesus' project. And this project consists in being God's minds and hearts and hands by giving expression in words and actions to this new world that God desires to bring about, a world of new creation where relationships between humans are made right and relationships with the planet Earth are healed and through all of that, our relationship with the holy mystery is deepened again and again. The beatitude is not about the poor in this world becoming rich in heaven. This beatitude, like all the rest, has to do with life in this world, life as it is in its mixed bag condition, and this life as God yearns it to be. The Beatitudes are not simply pious descriptions of classes of people, but a resounding call to me and to you to stop being part of the problem and to become part of the solution by modeling a different kind of world, a different kind of church, all the while leaning into the Holy Spirit for support and encouragement. This different kind of world will have more and more people choosing to be poor 
in some respect in service to their brothers and sisters. This different kind of world will have fewer and fewer people suffering from poverty imposed on them by others. Utopian, perhaps. But then again, our world currently has a lot fewer poor people than there used to be on planet Earth. Every year, Nicholas Kristof insists on reminding us about that startling fact. And there are countless folks, some of them we know, who give their substance to aid victims of natural and human disasters. The Jesus who pronounces the poor blessed and belonging to the reign of God is the very same Jesus who ended his life in total solidarity with all innocent victims of abuse, of violence, in total solidarity with all those who are poor, hungry, weeping, and hated by others. Every time we celebrate this Eucharist, we are saying out loud that we want to be of his company, of his mission, even if it costs us. Some folks stop coming to Mass because they find it boring. Perhaps those of us who do continue to come need to find the experience of Mass at times a bit scary as we consider whether we are willing to undergo the transformation that Jesus, who enters us as word and food, wants to work in us.